Amen. Hey, on Wednesday nights, I want to invite all of you guys out. We're going through James, and the title of the series is Apps for Life, Applications for Life. And about a month ago, as we were doing a verse by verse through the book of James, we came across the area of temptation. And I praise the Lord that I have an opportunity to share that message with you regarding temptation. No matter if you've been walking with the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years, temptation is all around us, amen? Probably as you were driving here to church, or maybe even here at church, you experienced a little temptation. And it's, temptation is not just a sexual temptation, but there's temptation to cut corners, there's temptations to make it rich quickly. We have all of these temptations that are before us, so what's really important is for us to know how to deal with these temptations. Brian Chappelle says this in his book called Holiness by Grace. It's called Saved from the Lions. Several years ago, my wife Kathy and a friend took their kids to the St. Louis Zoo. Big Cat Country had just opened up, which took the lions and tigers out of their cages and allowed them to roam in large enclosures. Visitors could observe the cats by walking on elevated skyways above their habitats. As my wife and her friend took the children up one of the skyway ramps, a blanket got tangled in the stroller wheel. Well, Kathy, she knelt down to help untangle the wheel while our preschool boys went on ahead. Well, when Kathy looked up, she discovered that the boys had walked through a small gap in the fencing and had climbed up on the rocks some 20 to 25 feet above the lion pen. Well, pointing to the lions below, they called back to their mother, Hey, Mom, look, we can see them. They had no concept of how much danger they were in. But what could Kathy do if she screamed? She might startle the boys perched precariously above the lions. The gap in the fence was far too small for her to get through. So she knelt down and she spread her arms and said, Boys, come get a hug. They came running from, for the love that saved them from danger greater than they could perceive. He ends the story with, With similar love, our Savior beckons us from temptation that would devour us. This morning, we're going to talk a lot about temptation. So please turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James is in the New Testament, and James is the half-brother of Jesus. And James is right after the book of Hebrews, towards the end of your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in front of you. And if you don't have one in front of you, we'd love to give you one after service. So you can do some outlining and some highlighting in your own Bible. James chapter 1. Always good to hear Bible pages turning. Everybody there? All right, here we go. James chapter 1, starting at verse 12. It says this. James says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Let us jump right into our study this morning. Our first point that James wants, James wants to teach us about is about the fight. He says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. He starts off this really tough section with, you're blessed. The word blessed here means supremely blessed. So James says that you are supremely blessed if you endure temptation. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to, to endure temptation? It means to remain or to abide not to flee, but to persevere under misfortunes and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Christ, to bear bravely and calmly. So let's reread this. So blessed, supremely blessed, is the man or woman who bears bravely, who remains or perseveres and not succumbs 
to temptation. James says that you are supremely blessed when it comes to the area of temptation if you are able to endure. So I guess one of our questions are, well, what's temptation? So glad you asked. Temptation is an enticement to sin, whether arising from the desires or from outward circumstances. You see, temptation is something that all of us will go through. No matter how old, how mature, or how spiritual we think we are, temptation is something that all of us will have to face, deal with, and maybe even right now, some of you are dealing with pretty strong temptations. So what do you do with that? Well, first, James wants us to know that we are blessed if we endure, if we hold on, if we trust Jesus, because temptation shouldn't make us powerless. Sometimes temptation, it, it feels so strong, doesn't it? There's like five of you that agree. Let me talk to you five. <laughs> temptation feels really strong sometimes where it's just drawing you and calling you, and it's almost you feel like you can't do anything but say yes to it. I will follow you. I will, whatever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do is what I'm going to do. That's not the way it should be. The Bible says that we are no longer slaves to sin. Now, if you're here without Jesus Christ, you are a slave to sin. But if you're here and Jesus is your Savior, we're no longer slaves to sin. The Bible says that we are slaves to righteousness. We have the Holy Spirit in us. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power to say, I'm not doing that. I'm not going down that road. This temptation is not going to lead me. No, I'm going to stick close to Christ. I am not a slave. I can say no whenever I want. Our problem is saying no. We have the power to say no, but we don't always say no. So James starts off saying that, oh, you are supremely blessed if you endure temptation. But there's going to be a fight. So he says, hang on, fight the good fight. But now James is going to talk to us about our reward. I'm not sure about you, but I like to see the finish line in things. I don't like to just go through this thing called life and think it's going to go on forever the way it is. I need to know that one day all of the struggles, all of the strife, all of the heartache, all of the things that we go through, I want to know one day is going to be better. <laughs> I want to know one day that we're going to make it. And as we read the last book of the book of the book of Revelation, it says that we win. It says that if we continue in Christ, we're going to win, that everything is going to be okay. There's like a finish line here. And James says, for when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. To the one who is tried of faith and integrity. Family, it's about enduring our trials. It's about enduring all of these temptations. It will be worth it all because we will receive this crown. What's so cool about this crown of life, it's only mentioned in two places. The first one is here in James, and the second one here is mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. It says, Do not fear any of those things which, are about to, which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, you're thinking, okay, great. What's I got to do with me? I'm not going to be thrown in jail. Take a small little trip over to Iraq where our brothers and sisters, this is real for them. They're reading the scriptures and they're going, hey, this is my life. I think sometimes we read the scriptures and say, oh, that's not for me. That's not for me. James is saying this is a crown of life. Those that endure, those that suffer. So I want to encourage you that one day all of our trials and tribulations, they are going to be over with, but we've got to endure. Because James says the Lord has promised the crown of life to those who love him. You see, when I love Jesus, I'm going to want to stay on this, this narrow path. So when temptation comes my way, oftentimes it pulls us. It's luring us off of the path that Jesus has for us. And it says, hey, come over here. You deserve this. You've been working hard. You've been doing really good. Or maybe you're not getting this at home. You know, this isn't happening at home. And 
hey, lo and behold, someone says, hey, good morning, you look nice today. And what do you think? When was the last time my husband said I look nice today? It's been a while. So what do you do? You're getting off that little path a little bit. No amens on that one, right? That never happens at all. That doesn't happen at all. What is it doing? You're slowly off, getting off God's path. But James says those that love Jesus. So our love for Jesus must keep us on the path. Our love for Jesus must keep us just straight up and focused. Why do we love Jesus? The Bible says because he first loved us. That Jesus loved us so much that he would give his life for us. That he would set us free. So as I'm serving Jesus and temptation comes my way, God help me to stay on Jesus' path. God help me to not float off Jesus' path. May I endure, may we endure temptation because in doing so, we are blessed over and over again and then God will give us this crown of life. So number one, we learned about the fight. Number two, James is going to teach us about this little problem we have called the blame. Let's read verse 13. He says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. You ever utter those words, God, why? What are you doing to me, God? We're doing so well. I'm coming to church. I'm reading. I'm praying. I'm tithing. I'm serving. Everything's going so well, God. Where in the world did this temptation come from? Anybody ever have that? You're just going along, you're doing your own thing, and then all of a sudden, bam! I mean, like a big temptation. You're like, what? God, I was doing so well. God, why would you tempt me this way? God, you know this is my kryptonite? You know I can't say no to this one thing, God? Why would you put this in my way? How are the ladies of the church doing this morning? <laughs> How are you guys doing? You know, I'm kind of thinking like maybe on a Saturday, you know, you've worked hard all week and you said, you know what, I'm going to go have some me time. I'm going to go to the mall and I'm just going there to get a pretzel. I'm going to just do some window shopping. I'm not going to buy anything. I'm just going to kind of go there and just, I'm just going to look around. That's what your mindset is, right? You know, your credit cards are probably almost maxed. You know that you shouldn't be spending any money. So you're just going for some me fellowship. You know, you go there, you step in the mall, pretzels on the mine, then all of a sudden, ooh, 50% off. Only today. This is the only day in history that that purse is going to be on sale. God, why are you doing this to me, God? Why are you tempting me this way? God, you know, we just argued about money last night. God, why would you put the purse right in front of me? Not only that, God, only today, only today can I get 50% off. Maybe my husband will be proud of me because it was on sale. <laughs> so what do you do? You have the pretzel in hand and now a bag in hand. You go home and you say, honey, you would be so proud of me. You'd be so proud. I didn't spend a bunch of money. It was on sale. It's okay. I don't know why God keeps doing this to me, honey. I don't know. All I wanted was a pretzel, and God put this in my way. God, stop doing this. You're getting me in trouble, God. I wonder if God says, really? I'm doing this to you? I'm putting temptation in your way? It seems that we like to put ourselves in temptation's way, and then we go to, to blame God. That should not be so. Commentator Philip said, God finds sin utterly repulsive in all of its forms, and his whole being burns against it. God will never, ever tempt you or I with sin. Why? Because sin is what his son died for on the cross. He died a horrible death, a horrific death, because of sin. So why would God use sin to cause us to stumble? God would never do that because he's holy. Now, our view of holy is just holy, clean. No, God is holy in everything, in every way. God is holy. So a holy God is not going to take something like sin, something dirty and filthy, something that causes pains and pain and breaks up families and, and causes death. He's not going to use that and say, hey, good luck with that. Let me see how, how you do with it. 
He's not going to do that. Listen to what the Bible says about God's holiness. Revelation chapter 4, it says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night. What do they say in church? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So they see the risen, exalted Savior. Their only response is holy. Holy, holy are you. And praise the Lord, one day we're going to see Jesus high and lifted up. We're going to bow that knee and say, God, you are so holy. You are so holy. So a, a holy God would never tempt us with something as horrible as sin. It seems it's our nature, brothers, sisters, friends, to place ourselves in temptation's way because it's kind of exhilarating. It's that kind of newness. I guess I kind of like it to this little picture right here. Let us take a day and let's run with the bulls. It's like a friend calling you and saying, hey, you want to take a trip to Spain? Here, sure, Spain sounds great. Well, what are we going to do in Spain? Well, we're going to run with the bulls. I would say, are you, is this, are you speaking metaphorically or symbolically? Because running in front of a thousand-pound bull with horns, that doesn't sound fun to me. But obviously for a bunch of people, it sounds like it's a great time. Let me put myself in temptation's way because I'll be okay. I guess we have to ask this guy, how was your morning working out? <laughs> the bull you are running from, obviously he has caught you. <laughs> Sir, why are you hiding from a bull on the ground? Is this how you wanted your morning to go, sir? You wanted to mess around with temptation? Oh, yeah, the bull will never catch you. No, you're just going to run in front of him. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, no, everything will be fine. We're just going to be having, we'll have a good time. This last little guy here. <laughs> I'm quite sure the story doesn't end here. I'm sure in about a second from now, he's going to have the bull's horn somewhere lodged back here. And then the doctor is going to say, hey, how was your time here in Spain? What possessed you to want to run in front of a bull? Oh, they said it was going to be a great time. Oh, the bulls will never catch us. Oh, everything will be fine. And he takes a selfie. Look at me. <laughs> Does anyone see the thousand-pound bull behind me? This was a great time in my life when I had two legs. <laughs> Very much like temptation. Very much like I'm going to put myself in temptation's way and then when the bull catches up to me, you know what? It's going to be someone else's fault. Maybe the bulls weren't from Spain. Spain bulls, they don't do things like that. It's someone else's problem and someone else's fault why things didn't work out for me. This reminds me of what Adam said back in Genesis. Most of you know the story. God says, hey, here's a grove of trees. You can eat as much as you want. But this one tree, I want you to stay away from. It's not good for you. Not good things will happen if you partake of this. So, Eve has her conversation, forbidden fruit comes down, Eve takes some and she gives some to Adam, and God says, hey, how's everybody doing out here? Genesis 3, God says, what's up, Adam? Adam says, hey, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Adam's like, God, what had happened was this. I wasn't doing anything. The woman you gave me is her fault. I wasn't even anywhere near the tree, God. And, and God, if you really wanted to be specific about it, you made her. <laughs> You're the one that said I needed her. You said I was lonely. You, you took a rib from here and I slapped. That whole thing was your idea, God. <laughs> so if we're really to think about it, God, this whole problem is kind of... <laughs> let me go and let you and Eve work out this problem, okay? Because it's not my problem. That's kind of how we are when things don't go right in our lives. God, why? What's going on? Well, James is going to teach us that the problem is you. What? Now, pastor, you don't know my story. 
the person sitting. <laughs> That's the problem. No, 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 no. James tells us the problem is you. <laughs> I know people don't tell you very often that you're the problem because they're probably afraid that they're going to offend you. You are your problem. It's not anyone else's fault. It is you and you alone. Because listen to what James says in verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Enticed means to be lured and attracted. So James says it's your own desires when you're drawn away by those desires that are already in you. The devil didn't make you do it. The situation didn't make you do it. What you're going through didn't make you do it. It is you. No amens for that, huh? <laughs> that it's your problem is still kind of soaking in. Let that marinate all day. It is you. It is us. That is the problem. James is saying it's not your parents' fault. It's not your grandparents' fault. It's not where you were raised. It's not the job you have. It's not the people. He's saying the problem is you. Deal with the sin and temptation that's already in you. I like this little baby. He says, I can sometimes resist mischief, but not temptation. And that's all of us sometimes, isn't it? We can resist for a little while, and then it's just that temptation that comes our way. And something inside of us says, you know what? I would like to have that. Regardless of the cost, I would like to have that. Well, James goes on and he says, each one is drawn away. Interesting word. Each one is drawn away from, from where? Drawn away from the path that God has for us. If we're doing good, then sin and temptation wants to draw us away from the path that God would have for us. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So this gate, everybody, a lot of people are on it. But then God says, there is this narrow gate that I want you on. So God, if you're a believer, God has us on this narrow, narrow road. And it's a road that's safe. It's a road that's going to keep us from hurting ourselves and hurting other people. So it's when we get off this road, because I want what I want, and when I want it, I want it now. God says, oh, you're off my road, but hey, do your thing. And God's going to keep on beckoning us back. Come on back. Come on back. Oh, God, but I deserve this. God goes, mm-hmm. You're the problem. It's not that you deserve this because God gives us grace and mercy. So what we deserve is for God to leave us out there. So God says, come back up here on this path because that wide gate that's so free in the end is going to lead to destruction. We as Christians, we should have the greatest time in the world. We're loved by God cares for us. When we die, we're going to go to heaven. God will not keep any good thing from you. Can I get an amen? amen? God will not keep any good thing from you. But have you noticed that we like to eat junk food? Have you noticed that we tend to like the things that are the worst for us? God says, okay, you have that for breakfast. It's not going to go well for you. And we keep on partaking. So God says it is the narrow road that's going to be a blessing. Because if we continue to not heed the words of God, if we continue to, to, to not read the scriptures, we're going to have a really hard time. And what's great about the scriptures is we can read about the folks that walked before us. Well, what did they do when they struggled with temptation? There's a man in the Bible. His name was David. He was a king. The Bible says that David was a man after my own heart. That means David, his love for God was like this. But David had a pretty big trial, a pretty big temptation. And it went little like this. It says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sat and inquired about this woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the <coughs> wife, <coughs> wife, of Uriah the Hittite, King David. God gave David an out. There's nothing wrong with David. He's, it's his palace, his roof. Went up there, walked around, and whoa, let me go this way. 
that's not for me. What God has given for me is, is downstairs. That beautiful, let me leave. Not only did he not leave God's first opportunity he gave David, David said, hey, who, who is that? Who's that over there? Oh, that's, uh, that's Bathsheba, my king. That's the wife of Uriah. David could have said, oh, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> that's, not, that's not for me. If you know the story, David didn't stop there. Family, God will always leave us a way out. David didn't have his feet nailed to the ground where, oh, I want to leave, but I can't go. <laughs> oh, my feet aren't working. No, God always leaves us a way out. Listen to 1 Corinthians. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond which you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So God is saying, there is a way out. There is a way of escape, but you've got to take it. God says, this is the way. You want out of this temptation? Use the stairs. There's a little light on there for you. Our problem is we don't always like to use the stairs. Let me just hang out here a little bit more. Paul told Timothy, and Timothy, by the way, was not a young man at this time. He tells Timothy, flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Paul is telling Timothy, a grown man, to flee youthful lust. You guys want to see what uh, fleeing looks like? Glad you asked. <laughs> this is what fleeing looks like. But I'm here to tell you that there's really only two people in this picture fleeing. Let me show you. These two guys are fleeing because their hands are empty. The guy said, you know what, I'm going to leave the camera right where it is because I'm about to die. I'm going to leave the bag right where it is because it means nothing to me compared to my life. This other young man here is being choked by the camera that he does not want to drop. A bear is chasing him and he's holding a camera. This man is holding a $10 reflector and he's about to die. When God says flee, that means you drop everything. Camera's got to stay where it is. Bag's got to stay where it is. He's not even waiting for his friend. He's like, I'm out. A bear is coming. Each man for himself. Flee temptation to run away from it. Because family, if we don't flee temptation, James is going to tell us, oh, brought this one. Temptation sometimes. Instead of wanting to, to leave, we get a little close to the, to the fire and kind of warm ourselves, don't we? We're like, you know, I know I should go, but I'm not really doing anything wrong. Let me just warm my hands by this fire here. It's okay. It's all innocent. I'm not doing anything. I haven't said anything. I've not crossed any lines. But still yet, you're just warming the hands. And then eventually you'll say, you know what, let me, let me get a chair. Let me just sit down next to this fire a little bit. I'm not doing anything. I know I should be fleeing, but, oh, this fire feels really good. Hmm, maybe I should stay just a, a little while longer. Then you find yourself staying a lot longer. And if we choose to stay, we're going to find out the results. Verse 15, James says, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. All of the rationalizing that we tend to do when it comes to sin and temptation, well, I deserve it, I'm not getting this, this is going on, and I've been without this for so long. Let me go ahead, God, and help you out and take care of myself. No one does that, right? Because we're spiritual, right? We never say, God, I got this one covered. No need for your help. I'll take care of all of my needs. Never really works out well. When we do things like that, what we're actually doing is we're planting some seeds, each time we don't flee, each time we stay, each time we warm ourselves by the fire, we're just planting more seeds. Not only that, we begin to water those seeds. And then sometime down the road, that little seed begins to grow. And we're like, hey, wh where did you come from? Well, each time you decided to stay there and not flee, 
you're just watering that seed. It's just growing, growing, and growing more and more. And you have to ask yourself, wow, this seems a little powerful. Let me leave you with this story. It's called Sinking with the Tuna. It says, for the first time in 47 years, the tuna were running only 30 miles off Cape Cod, and they were biting. All you needed to catch one was a sharp hook and some bait. And the rumor was that Japanese buyers would pay $50,000 for a nice bluefin. Well, many inexperienced fishermen ignored Coast Guard warnings and headed out to sea in small boats. What they didn't realize was the problem wasn't catching the fish. It was reeling in the giant tuna and pulling it aboard. The Christiane, a 19-foot boat, capsized while doing battle with the tuna. The same day, basic instinct suffered the same fate, while official business, a 28-footer, was also swamped after it hooked a 600-pound tuna. Fishermen on these boats underestimated the power of the fish they were trying to catch. Listen to this. This is what temptation does to us. It looks great on the surface. Only after we hook into it do we discover its strength. That is how temptation is. So what must we do, family? We must flee temptation. We must guard our hearts for out of it spring the issues of life. Let me give you a couple of things to take home with us. So keep calm. We have an extra exit strategy for you. The first one is, whatever you're about to do, whatever you're tempted to do, does it line up with Scripture? Pretty simple, right? Temptations before you, does it line up with Scripture? What does the book of Philippians say? It says, whatever is pure, whatever is true, whatever things are honest, just, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, if there be any virtue, anything praiseworthy, think on these things. So send your actions through a little sieve of Philippians. And if it doesn't meet that test, guess what? It's not for you. Number two, team up on Tuesday, Sundays today, Monday, Tuesday, the men's and women's Bible study starts. You might be thinking, okay, that's great. Well, you know what? I have kids. Oh, man, what are we going to do? Oh, hey, we have child care for you. Come on out. Oh, hey, I work in the evening. Well, you know what? We have it at 9 o'clock in the morning. Ladies, come at 9 o'clock in the morning. Bring your kids. We have child care for you. It's going to be a great time. They meet right here. Or you can say, you know what? I'm not available in the morning. I'm glad you said that because at 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights, we have another session here. Oh, well, I have kids. Well, we have child care for you. What a wonderful opportunity to grow. But some of you are thinking, you know, I'm just tired. But yet we go home after work and watch what? Four hours of TV, Sports Center. Oh, no hands go up now, huh? You're too holy to raise your hands in church. We know we watch hours of Sports Center, and it just loops and loops and loops. So put that on record. Come to church, men, and meet some godly men. Grow in your faith. Ladies, come to church and meet some godly ladies. Well, I'm kind of nervous. I'm kind of afraid. Stop all of that. Come to church like you are now and grow in your faith. You're going to grow. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to grow in your faith. And then lastly, we need to get radical on stuff. We normally wait until January 1st before we get radical. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to do all of that. For some of you, today is the day to get radical. Today is the day to say, you know what? I'm done doing what I'm doing. I'm done playing next to the fire. It's all done. No amens again for that one, huh? I'm done. I'm done with it. My life is for Jesus Christ. I'm going to get myself on God's path. I'm going to repent of my sins, and I'm going to get on the path. But in order to get radical, that means you got to get radical. Jesus says if your eye offends you, take that guy out. Your hand's offending you, cut that off. How are my guys doing this morning? Good? <laughs> Talked about the ladies. Let me talk to you for a second. If pornography is your issue, man up about it. Put the computer in, the, in the, the family room where everybody's there, when no one's home, don't go on it. Or get some accountability software that emails your accountability partner each time you go online. You go on online, email, email. Your friends answer, pick up the phone. It's me calling. 
I see where you're going. Answer the phone. That's being mature about it. But not being a Christian man would be like, oh, I've got this all myself. I can take care of this. No, you can't. That's why we need each other. None of us have a, a cape on it that says super Christian. We need each other. So for us to say, I don't need my brothers, that's foolish, foolish, foolish. And if I can say the word dumb in church, that's dumb, men, for us to think we can do this thing all by ourselves. So I want to encourage you. Don't be so, Jesus, your word says that in my weakness, you're strong. So Jesus, I'm weak and I need some help. So I would encourage all of you, do something with what you heard today. Those of you that are involved in something, break it off. Cut it off. Done with it. Jesus, I'm yours. Here I am. 